uh, start with um, phenomenological applications of uh, modern amplitude methods and ideas. So in today's lecture and tomorrow, I will be uh, discussing a class of observables uh, in collider physics, which, which is called event-shaped observables. And uh, here I list a few, uh, a couple of reference on the event shapes, uh, which uh, originally were uh, measured in E plus E minus two hydrons uh, experiments, but these um, uh, uh, literatures are um, focusing on the study of event shapes in equals four super young mills. And I will explain what is interesting from both the theoretical and experimental point of view. Um, and uh, what we can learn uh, about, uh, about the quantum field theory by computing these observables. So the event shape that I'm talking about uh, basically refers to the class of observables called the energy or charge or scalar flow correlators. Um, and uh, intuitively, they describe how the energies or charge or the scalar numbers are deposited in the final state that comes out of a particle scattering. And uh, it, it can, um, so by measuring these kind of observables, we can tell are there are collimated energy flux or charge flux in the final state. Are the event jet-like or is, or is it, or are the, um, the energies evenly distributed such that the event is spherical? Uh, so these class of observables um, uh, are, have been, are measured at the LHC um, with high precision. And for theoretical physicists, it, it's very uh, crucial to provide, uh, to provide precision calculations of the event shape observables, which will help us uh, to do phenomenological studies, for example, the um, determination of strong coupling or the, the, determine, uh, the discovery of certain SUSY signals in the LHC. Um, but more importantly, this type of observables that means a unified and nice descriptions in quantum field theory, uh, it can, they can be written in terms of the correlation functions, and I will talk about it um, in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, so there is a close connection between the event shape observables to the essential subjects in the CFD study, uh, namely the li uh, conformal library OPE, um, so there is a, um, a, this kind of observables um, kind of serves as a bridge between experimental uh, studies and uh, the formal studies of the CFTs. Um, so I will start with the, the uh, precise de definition of the energy energy correlators. So uh, we can, uh, the final state um, of the particle scattering experiment can be uh, sort of as a ensemble of particles which are characterized by the energy flow, uh, which measures the energies that carries by certain particles that enter into its detector that, that is located at a certain direction uh, given by this vector n. So if we have a single energy detector, then we can measure uh, this energy flow uh, observable, which uh, so so you can, which is the differential cross section integrated against a measurement function, um, with uh, weighted by the energies um, of the particles carried by the particle that goes into a detector uh, at a certain direction. Um, so. For E plus E minus two hadrons, um, we can measure this quantity, but normally in experiments, we use unpolarized beams. Uh, so in the final state, there's a spherical symmetry. Um, and for that reason, the, the energy flow is simply a constant and it has no like, angle dependence. The normalization condition tells us that this event shape as a function of the angle must uh, be normalized to the total energies um, that in, the, in uh, the center of mass energy. So you can see that it's just a constant divided by four pi. So there is nothing much interesting, uh, can, uh, interesting information containing this observable. Uh, so 
uh, but um, we can formally write down a, a, a representation in terms of a three-point correlation function. So basically, we can define our energy detector as the energy flow operator, which is a stress tensor uh, operator, um, um, which, which are sent to the future, future null infinity and then integrated along the, its retarded time. So uh, if we define the, uh, the, uh, the detector as this energy flow operator, we can find that this operator acting on the uh, final state, asymptotic states, uh, gives you uh, exactly the measurement function that we write down here. So therefore, you can convert this this integrated differential prospection into a, into the Fourier transform of a three point correlator. Here, E is the energy flow operator, and the O two O's are uh, represents the electromagnetic currents uh, that source the our um, particle scattering experiment. So here, this denominator is simply a normalization factor, sigma total. Um, so that's the definition for the single detector energy flow. Um, um, excuse me, I, can I ask you a question? Sure. I, I, I don't understood well why, um, why this uh, correlator appear from uh, the previous formula. So how we can uh, go from the so, top formula to, to the other one? Yeah. So in the amplitude calculation, you have uh, you have a matrix element, uh, like um, which is uh, sourced by this local operator O, for uh, for example the electromagnetic current, and X is the final state. So you square it and integrate it against this measurement function. Right. Okay, so the, fir the first thing you wrote will be the uh, cross section in 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 in, uh, in the left yeah. formula. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is sigma amplitude okay. squared. Yeah, and then uh, so this delta function combined with this external state x is given by this energy flow operator acting on the external state. So. Therefore, if you insert this operator here, effectively, it's like inserting a, uh, a, a complete set of states times this delta function. So yeah, so these, you can see that these two equations are the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Uh, so, we can generalize this definition to the case where we have two energy detectors sitting at a, a certain directions, N1 and N2, which are separated by the angle chi. Um, so these, we can define this energy two, the two point energy correlator uh, by this measurement function where you fix the angle uh, of one pair of particles that entering these two detectors. And uh, this angle, the cosine of this angle is related to this variable Z. And the event shape is a function of this variable Z, uh, which goes from zero to one, as the angle between the particles go from zero to, uh, to 180 degrees. So uh, in terms of the uh, correlation function, this uh, event shape can be written as the four point correlators. Uh, they, they are given by the two source and sink as well as the two energy flow operator representing the two detectors. Um, so, so that's so much for the definitions. Uh, in order to get a bit more familiar with this observable, we would like to do a uh, leading order computation of an energy energy correlator, namely EEC in E plus E minus two hydrons. Um, so what I mean by the leading order is that I ha we have a two to three process where we have one pair of quarks and a gluon in the final state. 
uh, because at the Born level, you only have two particles, then the momentum conservation in standard mass frames tells us the uh, two particles entering into the detectors must be separated by 180 degree. Uh, so that, that just gives us a delta function, which is not interesting. So we normally define this leading order as the one loop order where you have an emission of external gluon. And therefore, the, the, main, the key ingredients that we need for this computation is the five-point scattering amplitude uh, for you know, E plus E minus to QQ bar uh, plus gluon. Um, and we need to integrate the amplitude squared against this measurement function, reweighted by the energies that are entering into the detectors. So since, recall that uh, yesterday we talked about uh, color order amplitudes and uh, in QCD and in N plus four. And the QCD amplitude can be sort of as a component of the N equals four amplitude. Uh, and in particular, in this case, although we have a pair of electrons, not just quarks, anti-quarks, uh, there is still a way to embed this five point uh, scattering amplitude into the n equals four super amplitude. Uh, let me explain. So if you have these helicity configurations in the final state, and then, um, I mean, at tree level, uh, you can write down Feynman diagrams and uh, where you can see that, um, well, like this. So the electrons like behave just like a quarks and uh, the photon behaves just like a gluon. So it can be uh, related to the QCD amplitude with this particular uh, type of helicity uh, configuration. And here we have two pair of quarks with different flavor. So we assign them with different flavor. Uh, the reason is the following. Uh, if we want to interpret this QCD amplitude as a component of the N equals four uh, amplitude, uh, we must avoid, uh, uh, first of all, we must uh, uh, avoid the case where this uh, gluon is attached to this internal legs, uh, which is the photon. Therefore, we must uh, only, uh, we can, uh, can consider a particular color ordering where this gluon is not color ordered, uh, not color adjacent to the um, to the leptons. Um, and the second type of subtlety is that we must avoid scalar exchange while you cover you, you cover coupling between the uh, fermions. And in N equals four, it is part of the story, but. Uh, we we do not uh, need to uh, we do not want to include such diagrams into our calculation. Otherwise, the result will be wrong. So, how do we avoid such diagrams? Well, um, because the scalars cannot change the uh, helicities, so if, uh, but they change the flavor. So uh, that means when we arrange these um, helicity configurations. Uh, we, uh, when two helicities are, to, uh, the helicities of two fermions are, are, not, uh, are different, we assign different flavor to them. But when they are, uh, and uh, therefore you cannot have, but, but when the flavors are the same, uh, you assign different uh, helicities. So if you have these configurations, you cannot have like Q1 and Q, uh, Q1 minus and Q1 plus exchanging a scalar. Um, so the, the only exchange, uh, the type of interaction that you can have is the gluon exchange, which is essentially the photon exchange. So uh, since we justify these, uh, our, of techniques, um, we can proceed with the calculation. So we can extract this five point the QCB or E plus E minus um, amplitude from the five point MHV amplitude uh, in equals four. 
Well, you, we also have the MHV bar amplitude, which is just a complex conjugate. Um, so I hope you have already practiced these kind of games. Um, by extracting the uh, component, we simply integrating over the eta variables associated with external legs. Um, and if you do the computation, you integrate against this uh, momentum conservation delta functions. And here is the final answer um, where uh, we have, uh, we uh, in, in general, this A, B are, are the SU4 indices um, for the external fermion lines. So in our case, we want to assign uh, these, uh, these two, Two, two quarks, so uh, like um, representing the leptons with a certain type of flavor, one, and these two quarks associate, uh, representing the quarks with a different type of flavor, uh, and they have different helicities. So therefore, this is the final answer. Um, you know, here you need to, uh, you only need the second terms in this expression. Um, okay, so this is um, sorry, can I, yeah. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, but um, are so A, D, B, C are uh, are indices or yes, SU4 okay. are indices. You okay. in N plus four. So it's like when when I integrate uh, with those eta, that, that's the point where I like I. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, there he this eta says as carries these indices like okay e c d okay i see and and to, okay yeah and Great. i assign these particular numbers to a b c d mm -hmm. such that we can avoid the scalar exchange mm -hmm. okay yeah. Um, so here's the final answer. It is quite compact, and uh, uh, I, I think this in this way you can do the calculation without uh, uh, Feynman diagrams computations, uh, which might be uh, efficient when you have uh, when you go to higher orders, uh, like you have multiple particles in the final state. Um, but this only corresponds to one particular helicity configuration. And the other things can be related to this one by performing charge conjugation, which you can switch the helicity of one pair of leptons or, or quarks, or, uh, and, uh, and these uh, parity conjugation where you can flip the, uh, uh, the helicity of the gluons. Uh, so we have all the ingredients right now, and uh, so we can square this amplitude, uh, which is, takes the following forms. Uh, then the next step is to perform the phase space integration uh, against the, in, in, uh, the measurement function. So we have a five particle phase space, um, like PS3. Um, it can be parametrized in the following way. Here we can pull out an omega, uh, a, a um, d omega integral, which corresponds to the uh, like the orientation of, of our lab frame. Um, basically, we can uh, integ uh, we can rotate the lab frames, or if uh, rotate the beam directions, um, and keeping the angles of the detectors fixed. So this uh, kind of, you, you can carry out this integral freely uh, without uh, affecting the uh, in, uh, integration, um, the measurement function. Uh, and then there's a threefold integral over the three uh, uh, nanostem variables. And this is the um, energy conservation relations. Um, so in the matrix element, for the differential cross section, uh, we have mm, this type of structures um, where P2 is, is the one of the lepton and P4 is one of the, the quarks. Um, but when we do the integral over this, uh, when we integrate over the, uh, um, the orientation of the lab frame, or we need to average over the beam directions. So effectively, this P2 dot P4 structures 
can be given by um, uh, by this these two uh, tensor structures. Uh, you can fix these coefficients by actually doing these uh, angle integrals. But in the end of the day, uh, p2 dot p4 can be replaced by q dot p4 uh, squared um, because this g mu mu contracted with the onshore momentum p4 vanishes. So you can replace this p4 dot p2, p2 squared by q dot p4 squared, which you can write it as only the depending on the Mendelssohn variables for these uh, particles in the um, final state and independent of the information of the initial state. Um, after performing this trick, um, that here is the final answer for the uh, average, the square of the amplitude, um, which define depend on three independent Mendelssohn variables um, as one five S one four and S five four. Um, so the last step is to carry out the energy integration. Uh, namely, we carry out the integral over the Mendelssohn variables. Um, here it's convenient to uh, choose a set of variables x one, x four, x five. In the center of mass frame, they correspond to the energy fractions carried by the external particles p one, p four, and p five, and it has a, a defined by the ratios between the Mendelssohn variables and the center of mass uh, energies. Um, so, and in addition. Uh, our measurement function should fix the angles between one pair of particle. Let's say we measure particle four and five, and the, this angle variables can be uh, rewritten in this into a Lorentz invariant form, which is uh, given by the ratios of these x i j variables. So we can simplify these measurement function into a the function that only depend on these three x uh, energy fractions, and we carry out these uh, and uh, the threefold integrals from zero to one. Uh, but there is a momentum conservation delta function which kills one integrals. So in the end, you only have two a uh, twofold integral over x four or x five. Uh, so here is another subtlety is that. Uh, in, in in the experiment, we uh, we could measure any pair of particles uh, p4, p5, or p5, p1, and or p1, p5. So you need to consider three different uh, type of measurement. Uh, but uh, we can simply do a permutation uh, to summing over permutations for for the. Um, uh, or different permutations of the uh, differential cross section. Um, therefore, it is equivalent to summing over the three different type of measurement function. Right. So you can practice these integrals, and uh, this twofold integral gives you a a simple single logarithmic function of the angle zeta uh, z and, and and plus some other um, rational structures. So this is the EEC at leading order in QCD. Um, the first calculation of this um, observable was done back in the 70s. Um, and then it took about around 20 years for the theoretical theorists to proceed to the next um, loop order. Um, well, the subtleties in, the, in proceeding to higher loop order is uh, is that you need to do a phase space integral and you encounter infrared divergences and the measurement function is, is not so easy to deal with. I mean, it's not a standard uh, the type of Feynman integral where you can do the like, reductions easily. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a challenging task if you want to do precision calculations for the physical observables. Um, but for the EEC, fortunately, um, due to this nice operator definition in terms of correlation functions, uh, there were novel ways to perform the calculation directly from uh, offshore correlation functions, which I will talk about tomorrow. 
Uh, and the idea uh, originates from the study of these observables in Nenko's super young mu theory, which is a super conformal theory. So that naturally connects, to, uh, connects EEC to a conformal four point correlator in this theory. Uh, but today I will first start with an amplitude calculation in N equals four uh, super young mu theory by integrating over the Armstrong form factors. So the process that we are considering is a um, process in Lincoln's for super young mu theory uh, sourced by a local operator O. This O, we take it as a as an analog to the electromagnetic currents in QCD, uh, which is the so-called so half BPS operator. So it has it is to conserve the operator and, and it is actually a protected operator, uh, which does not get renormalized, and the three-point correlation function uh, does not have um, quantum corrections. Um, so if you um, Consider a process uh, where we have this uh, scalar operator decaying into final state particles, including uh, scalars and, glu glu and gluons and gluinos and so on. Uh, you can compute this uh, form factor um, defined in the following way. Um, this is the matrix element, and you square it and integrate it over the phase space, which will give you the uh, energy correlators in n equals four. So uh, what we need to know is the is what is what the form factor or the amplitude looks like. Um, so let me comment a little bit on this uh, operator, the half BPS operator. And it is um, actually uh, correspond to the lowest component of the so-called stress tensor multiplet T. Uh, so this is a uh, so here it's, it is made of the uh, squared of the uh, super multiple W, which is in an analog to the onshore uh, super uh, multiple phi that we talked about yesterday, uh, but it is not restricted to the onshore super, super space. Actually, it lives in the so-called harmonic super space. Um, but it's not uh, very quite relevant for our purpose here to to discuss the details. But basically, we, I, what I want to comment on is that this operator, the BPS operator, is a component of a larger uh, stress tensor multiplet, and there, this multiplet contains uh, it's called stress tensor multiplet because uh, it contains the stress energy tensor as well as the R charge and in the higher component. And it also contains the onshore Lagrangian in one of these components. Um, so because these different type of operators all belong to the same multiplet, uh, the uh, super conformal symmetries relate the correlation functions of, uh, of these operators um, with, to, with each other. Um, so here, uh, uh, what, what can the um, form factor you know, look like? Um, this T, uh, the super multiple, this analytic super field um, defining the super coordinate space parameterized by the theta and X variables. So this needs not to be confused with the dual coordinates um, that I talked about yesterday. This is just the coordinate space uh, variables, uh, not the dual space. Um, and uh, you can, uh, this dual space can be projected onto a harmonic super space by projecting the theta variables, uh, by contracting the theta variables with a pair of SU4 harmonic variables. Um, here, so, um, the uh, these are just called the theta plus and theta bar minus, um, and this uh, super multiple depend on theta and theta bar minus, and theta plus and theta bar minus, um, and 
Therefore, um, you can write down the tree level MHV form factor for the super uh, stress tensor multiplet. And it is given by the Park Taylor formula times three sets of delta functions. The first one is momentum conservation delta function. And the second, and the, the, the second one and the third one uh, correspond to the uh, super momentum conservation. Since we have projected this, uh, uh, the uh, super space onto the F uh, SU4 harmonics, the super translation uh, uh, delta function of factorized into uh, two, um, uh, two copies of delta functions um, corresponding to the different, um, well, uh, the uh, do different projections. So, and, uh, and this formula was uh, given in literature and I will not try to uh, prove it, but we will use it uh, later um, for, for computing the energy correlators. So um, in addition, we're interested only in the lowest component of the stress tensor multiple, namely the scalar operator. So we can set the uh, one of these theta and set both theta and theta bar to zero, um, which correspond to the lowest component. And uh, then these, um, the form factor that we actually need um, is, uh, is this one, uh, where you only have uh, one, uh, one momentum conservation delta function and a four dimensional uh, super uh, momentum translation uh, conservation delta function, which only define um, e depend on the eta minus, but not on the eta plus. Uh, so, well, eta minus correspond to a particular um, projection of the uh, of the eta variables. Um, so, um, today as an exercise, uh, please start with this formula um, here. Um, and uh, <laughs> compute the square of the matrix element and sum over superspace, namely integrate, integrating over the eta variables and to find the uh, uh, differential cross section. And it will by symmetries and uh, cyclic symmetries and some uh, dimensional analysis, you can tell you it's obviously it can only take this form. Uh, but please do the calculation to verify that is k is equal to two. Um, and then start from this matrix element. Uh, you can do the phase space integrals and compute the energy energy correlators in n plus four at leading order. Um, so um, if you do the calculation, you will find the final answer is uh, very similar to the QCD one. It has the same type of logarithms, but the rational structure is much simpler and it has uniform like, transcendental weight one. Um, in addition to the EEC, uh, in conformal theory, we can write down a general class of um, correlators of um, flows, um, which defines a class of event shapes um, and these event shapes and, and the operators are, and we consider are twist two operators and they, the energy or energy flow is one type of these operators. Um, and then we can define a correlator involving two uh, like library operators, um, which carries different spins. So it's defined by uh, sending the local operator to the future null infinity and integrating over the retarded time. And, and energy for the energy flow operator, this O is the stress energy tensor T mu mu uh, contracted with some reference in reference vectors. And for the R charge flow, uh, this op local operator is um, the uh, R current J contracted with some reference vectors. And for the scalar flow, it's just the, uh, the half BPS operator O. 
So these different operators carry different spin, but they're all twist two operators. Um, and the scaling behaviors um, for the event shape are completely determined by the quantum numbers um, S and S prime. So in general, the event shape must looks uh, must take the following form, uh, where you we can factor out the dependence on the uh, center mass energy and uh, the dependence on the on the uh, directions and then M prime, and it must take this following form for consistency, and. Uh, and the event shape is given by this factor times a arbitrary function that depend on the so-called cross ratios, which is the uh, the angle variables um, we we talked about earlier. It's um, well because in the center of mass frame, it's just given by the one minus cosine theta between the two detectors, um, and a. Oh, we only need to we need to compute um, what we need to compute and determine is this uh, function of the angle variables and for EEC we have finished the calculation and we can also do this calculation for the uh, charge charge correlator or the scalar scalar uh, correlator um well um so for the in order to do these calculations we need to know exactly about the information of the particle contents in the final state. Um, for example, for n equals, n equals four uh, at Born level, uh, you have this, uh, the local operator O uh, made of um, two, for, uh, two scalars, they decay into a pair of scalars and which goes into the final state. And uh, you can read off the expressions for the function of form factor from the formula that I gave earlier. And it's just a factor of the uh, eta variables. And we can extract the scalar component, uh, namely this particular diagram, by integrating over the eta one and eta two variables. And uh, by carrying out these integrals, we, uh, we find this um, formula for uh, the expression for this final diagram, um, where the U minors are the harmonics where we project these ethers onto. Um, so we can uh, repeat this exercise uh, for the case where we have three particles in the final state. And then we, uh, we find that there were two type of final state uh, configurations. And you could have two scalars and one gluons uh, for the NHV form factor. Or you could have one scalar and two gluinos. Um, and uh, there, the square uh, form factor is given here. Um, you can do the exercise yourself. And here I omitted the, the explicit dependence on these harmonics uh, and the SU4 indices because it does not depend on the kinematics and it's not very crucial for our purpose. So given this um, um, expression for the differential cross-section, uh, we can carry out the integral to compute the charge-charge correlator. Uh, basically for the charge correlator, our measurement function is such that we uh, we multiply apply the differential cross section with the charge um, for the for uh, S, uh, the SU four R charge of the final state particles, and we need to consider both uh, these uh, these two channels and uh, sum them together, and the result is given here. Um, well, it is still a event shape function depending on the angle variable theta. But the difference between the, Q, uh, the charge correlator and the energy correlator is just that the, the, the weight in the measurement function are different. We do not reweight the differential cross section by the energies, but by the R charge. And similarly, we can compute the scalar flow operator uh, where the measurement in a measurement function, uh, we, we, we multiply 
by the uh, the differential cross section by the scalar numbers. Therefore, we only need this. Uh, sorry, we only need this channel where we have two scalars in the final state. So by integrating over the uh, phase space, you can find the uh, form. Uh, the result is given here. So we can compare this explicit result, uh, including those for the e uh, the energy correlators, uh, with the master formula um, here, and we can check that this uh, explicit dependence uh, on the on the q squared and n and m prime are uh, actually correct um, and uh, the uh, the uh, event shift function the f s s prime uh, we can read off from these expressions and it turns out that they are exactly the same um, for the charge correlators scalar correlators and energy correlators uh, which is given by this formula at one loop order so and this is not a coincidence, but um, this is a consequence of the super conformal symmetries in N plus four, which relates the four point correlator for um, two uh, scalars and two stress energy tensors, two scalars and the two charge uh, operators, and four scalars. Um, I mean, there is a symmetry between these correlation functions. And uh, from this uh, correlation function, you can determine the energy, energy, charge, charge, or the scalar, scalar correlators. So in as a result, there must be a symmetry between these event shape observables. Um, so basically, these correlators all belong to this uh, a to uh, a component of the four point correlators of the uh, stress tensor multiplet. Um, so in order to compute the energy correlators, you can simply compute the correlator with four scalars. And then from that correlation function, you can extract the event shape OO, which is then related to the EE. Uh, event shape. So this um, is the a, a efficient way to do the calculation of the energy energy correlate at higher loop order, because at higher loop order, uh, this correlation function uh, is much simpler than this one, um, because the scalars has a, has a this uh, the strings uh, the spin structure of this correlation function is much simpler and has, has and has no dependence on complicated uh, tensor structures and it is has already been computed many years ago up to uh, three loop order um, and integral is given seven loop order um, I guess um, and therefore uh, that allowed us to compute the energy correlator from this higher loop of four point correlation functions, uh, which is a much more efficient way compared with the standard amplitude calculation where you need to deal with infrared divergences and phase space integrations. Um, so tomorrow I will, not tomorrow, on Friday, I will uh, introduce um, the offshore approach to do this calculation from correlation functions and see how it works and uh, see whether it's better than the amplitude approach. So that's all for the lecture today. Any questions? Hi, Kai. Thank you for the beautiful lecture. Um, can I ask you some question on, I think it was slide 20, the one I would like to understand better the part before that lead to the exercise. Yeah. Okay. So um, I understand like when we define the energy, uh, the, 
correlator in the harmonic superspace. And then I didn't understood how it's connected to the uh, etas of the um, super multiplet uh, of the sc scalar there. How the theta and the eta are connected here? Uh, uh, so here, this is the formula where you have a delta function that depends on this eta minus, where eta minus is the the original eta contracted with the harmonics. So at uh, for if you have only two points, like you only have one and two, then this tree level form factor is given by uh, this function. Uh, right, just by reading it off from, from, from the formula. And then uh, in order to uh, figure out what this diagram looks like, we can just integrate over the eta variables. Uh, because here the final state are the super multiplet, onshore super multiplet. And I want to project out uh, the, the state with two scalars. So that means I want to extract this eta squared component for each external let. That means I can integrate over the eta one and eta two. Sorry, so for even maybe dumber question, but uh, why the super multiplet has those uh, two plus? Like in my mind, there is a uh, the phi super multiplet. Um, uh, the phi, why does it? Because it's a, a this phi contracted with uh, with the harmonics, basically. Um, yeah, so yeah I don't, I don't, I don't phi maybe. AB, phi okay. CD, and okay. uh, it's contracted with yeah. some uh, some harmonics like U A U B, uh, okay. and I'm not so, so that, familiar with that uh, expressions, but yeah, it's just all co uh, projected onto the onto the harmonic. Okay, so, so the phi plus plus is the one projected? Yes. On u plus u plus? Yes. Okay, okay. I see. Um, okay. Um, can, can you go again to, to slide 20, please? Okay. So, so could, could you repeat like, uh, sorry again, the, the, the exercise. So we have to use the formula for the um, form factor. Yes, given this form, this form factor formula, uh, you need to square it. Uh, I mean, first conjugate it um, and then do the Fourier transform. Well, by conjugation, you change eta to eta bar, and then you do the Fourier transform back into the eta space. Uh, and then you sum over super space, uh, which means you integrate over the etas. Okay, okay. And the squared bracket will also like um, need to be changed when I, when I do the conjugation, they become, uh, sorry, the angle bracket. Yeah, yeah, the angle becomes the square bracket. That's okay. the normal um, parity conjugation. Okay, and yeah. okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kai, for this lecture. And um, now we have a little coffee break. And as usual, you can stay in the link. And if anyone wants, I guess you can make breakout rooms or you can also go to Gather Town. And